Hey guys! It's another Sasha Day Game podcast. Uh, I almost fell off the chair just then. Because I have a real live uh, tantric um, master slash guru slash awesome dude who does crazy things with people, including women, slash author. He's actually the author of uh, my favorite tantric book ever that I've read so far, the Rocky Horror Tantra book, which is uh, fantastic, and I, I plugged it before. And uh, so I'm super stoked to have a podcast with him and, and chat to him. And uh, he's coming down to the Direct Dating Summit event in Belgrade. So, yeah, it's just super fucking ridiculously awesome to actually have him on here and hog him to myself and just get into his head and, and just talk to him. It's freaking awesome. Jesus. Jesus. Um, so, yeah, it's a long one, as always. But, yeah, there's some juicy freaking bits. So And, and even some, some, some practical stuff you can do. Um, to start getting more sexy with your sexy times. So, yeah, strap in and get comfortable. Not too comfortable, but do get comfortable. And uh, let's get into it. Here we go. Boom! You all right? Cool. You want to see my sexy lady? Woo! I know, I know. You guys met before. Yeah. It's been a long while. Mm Mm-hmm. No. <laughs> That's right. So I'm going to talk like a little bit just about sort of my experience with Tantra, which sure. uh, is obviously uh, amateurish uh, compared to some people, but uh, but nevertheless, still a lot more than most people who don't know shit. Mm-hmm. So <laughs> he just did that cocky life. That's right. Nobody knows shit. No, no. Most people who think they know a lot too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's probably true. So um. So basically, I got a little lucky because when I was uh, young and horny, I was like 19, 20, and uh, I made friends with a guy called Dave, uh, Natural Dave, who is um, actually an old friend of mine back from Toronto, but he got into tantric somehow, and you know, I got my first sort of girlfriend where I was going to have regular sex with, I guess, uh, or the first one I actually sort of liked around 21 and he was coaching me he's like okay here's how you eat vagina and and there's some things you need to know and he's just like don't just ejaculate right away and i was like what he's like no no no. you gotta you have to you have to be aware of your level of, of how excited you are and if, if ejaculation is it like at a at an eight you have to like when you get to like a seven you gotta calm down and take a break and pull on play with your titties and stuff and then and then and then don't finish and then do it again and then you keep doing that and it gets better and then and then eventually um, you can have an orgasm without actually ejaculating. And I was like, you're fucking crazy. And he's like, no, you got to do it. And so I just I went on faith. He's like, look, it's going to make you really good. Trust me. You want to do this. Don't listen to everyone else. But he, he was, uh, he was like in his forties at the time. This was, this was a long time ago. Uh, but he'd already slept with like uh, huge amounts of women. And he was always dating like, you know, he, he was, you know, 44 or something. He was dating always 19, 22, year old, 23 year old girls, at least two or three at once. And they were all really gorgeous. So I'm like, well, if anyone, if, if, if I had any one expert in life I was going to listen to, it would be Dave. So I said, all right. So I went and I did this and, uh, you know, and, and, um, and, uh, and other things he told me such as, uh, when you pee, don't, uh, don't just pee, like wait till you get to pee and then start peeing and then stop peeing and then st- start peeing and then stop peeing and always do that. And you build up that muscle that makes you be able to stop ejaculating. So putting those two things together, I was actually able to have sex that I learned later on in years for a lot longer than the average guy because I could have sex for 20 minutes up to an hour uh, and I'd have, you know, regular 40, 45 minute sessions. Uh, I find most women didn't really want, like if they, they had lots of orgasms over 45 minutes, they I would say I can keep going. They'd be like, no, no, we're good. They, you know, a lot of girls just didn't really want more than 45 minutes, maybe an hour of sex. That, that was good enough. Um, and so because... So I was doing this stuff and I was always really good and, uh, you know, I, even as I got older and of course, you know, you start, you start realizing as you get older, the advantages of tantric or, or even just this aspect I was practicing are, uh, are really powerful because of course, you know, when you're really young, you can ejaculate and then five minutes later you want to have sex again. But as you get older, you realize, wait, you ejaculate, you're fucked. That's the, you're, you got to wait longer and longer before you can do it again. Uh, and so I realized, I remember, being, it, oh, it takes a huge amount of energy and we're going to be getting into that. I'm sure as we have a chat, but, um, but I remember when I was just as a little example of this, when I was 27, uh, 27, 28, you know, late 20s, I was still going strong, but I was, I was sleeping with this girl and, uh, yeah, we, we, we did it for a while, 10, 15 minutes. And I, and I just took a break for maybe 30 seconds, 40 seconds, just cause I was really close to ejaculating. 
And then I grabbed her again and had sex with her again. And I just kept doing this. And we went on for a while. And over a period of whatever, maybe 40, 45 minutes, I, I almost had an orgasm four or five times. I remember on the fifth time, as I, you know, I was kind of like, well, I was good. Okay. And I, I went in, I grabbed her again. And she, and she literally just, her reaction was just, again? Like she could not believe this was happening. She was like 23. And I, I don't think she'd ever had anyone who was multi orgasmic. So she, to her, it, I'm sure her spectral experiences were like, I'm sorry. <laughs> and, then, and then five minutes later, oh, oh, fuck, I'm sorry again. You know, I'm pretty sure that's what it was for her. So she was just blown away. So I'd had a lot of those experiences of girls just being uh, being surprised. Um, but I never uh, – So and, and so I never really developed it much more than, than, than that, the peeing exercise and uh, and just, you know, just, just holding it in and not being greedy. And also those went in with my general principles of just like make sure women are happy first. Uh, and, and, and one of my main rules was from the beginning, which is just common sense. I'm surprised not everybody does this. But it was just uh, make sure the girl has an orgasm first. If she doesn't have an orgasm, I'm not even going to bother and once mm. she's already like happy, then I'll worry about me being happy. And and so mm. I've had a lot of happy customers o- over the years. It's it's pretty pretty simple. And foreplay, never underestimate foreplay. Foreplay is, is your friend. Um, mm. So I never really took it took it uh, much further. And then when I was uh, in Australia, um, yeah, because my spiritual stuff didn't really start till um, maybe um, five six years ago. I really started getting into spiritual stuff. And I remember I was in Australia uh, two and a half, I think three years ago, in around two thousand twelve. And I, I went into some little trendy restaurant in uh, Sydney, as they have, and um, and I was flirting with this girl who worked behind the counter, and I just was kind of being semi playful but semi serious, and I just said, "Hey, you know, you're really, uh, you know, you're you're pretty sexy. You should be uh, should be one of my tantric partners." And she said, "Are you serious?" And I said, "Yeah." And she said, um, "And says, no, I do tantric. I've been practicing for years. I was in the school in Thailand for like uh, months doing this stuff." And she's like, and she's like, you're pretty cute, so I'd be down for that. I was like, oh, okay. So we end up back at her house, but instead of just having normal sex that lasts, you know, whatever, um, she said, oh, well, let's do this whole this whole thing. I said, okay, what's the thing? And so basically, what we did was we listened to some uh, some nice music. So it was specific music that like was really nice. Like I don't know whether it was, uh, yeah, it was like high vibrational music. So it was really really beautiful music. We listened to this music, and then we sat there and we did this exercise where we st- we stared into each other's eyes. Right, so she stared at one eye, and I stared at her eye, and uh, after like a couple of minutes, I started seeing um, like the form of this woman. It was like a stone woman, like almost like a stone statue with like beautiful eyes and a nose and and this long hair, and it was like a goddess. And I literally was like freaking out because I couldn't fucking. I was like, holy shit, I see an image of a goddess in, in in front of you, and but if I move my eye at all, it would disappear. But if I just kept staring at her eye, I would see it. So I was literally seeing into something much deeper than. Um, than just this beautiful girl who's in front of me. So that's when my brain was like, okay, there's something going on here <laughs> that's a lot more than just, uh, hey, I'm having sex. So and so so apparently the exercise was, you know, you stare and you know you see the Shiva Shakti, so she sees the, the the king and I see the the princess and the war uh, the the, the goddess and whatever. And um, that's what it was. And it was really awesome. And then of course we had sex. Now ironically we had set we proceeded to have sex with condoms because we just met. So it wasn't very tantric at all. <laughs> it was we basically we did all this <laughs> stuff and then we fucked. <laughs> I'll show guys wear rubber gloves too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Wait, have you seen guys wear rubber gloves during sex? No. Rubber gloves are not for fun reasons. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's a whole other <laughs> conversation. It's it, 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 it was it was um, Alonso of us just close advisors were doctors and things. So when the AIDS scare hit, it was like you listened to them a little too much, in my opinion. But anyway. You've got a big commune and lots of lots of free love happening. I guess you can't be too careful and new scary things seems to be there in the world. Yeah. So the rules were condoms, rubber gloves, fucking face masks. Oh god. You still get a continuance of that. I never I've never heard of that before, but uh, that's, oh. that's pretty funny. That's scary. Um, no, 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 it's not like they actually do it. That's just the rules. But hang on, I'm 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 still bringing it up to your big intro. Here we go. So I'm almost at the end. Um so basically, after that experience, I was like, okay, there's more going on here. And uh, eventually, I found uh, the Multi Orgasmic Man book uh, by Mantak Chia. I read a little bit of that. Um, and uh, yeah, experimented a little bit with some, some breathing exercises and stuff. Uh, but I never really put in the time, honestly, to, to, to really you know, get super awesome. Because frankly, the girls were happy. I was happy. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I never really went, went super far down the rabbit hole. Um, but then, as I now, as I get more into spirituality, and I've done San Pedro, and, and I've done uh, ayahuasca, and I've I've had other like awakenings and stuff, and I've had moments of like, oh my God, we're all one. Um, I realize that the potential for uh, tantra 
to um, because you know just I, I guess we're going to talk about this, but basically the the ultimate truth is that we're all one. We're all exactly the same bit of like God energy, and that's just what reality is. And you realize that during certain experiences. But what's awesome is during tantric, you can recognize that we're all one just by having this sexual experience with another person rather than you don't have to go fly anywhere or have a whole bunch of psychedelic drugs or anything like that. It's a really easy way to actually realize this ultimate truth and become enlightened. So so not only are you having sex and having fun, it's also a path to enlightenment, which is freaking awesome. So it's a really mm. uh, it's a really exciting thing. And uh, and uh, I still consider myself a complete amateur. Um, but that's why I'm, I'm doing this event and I'm having a couple of uh, uh, speakers who are, you know, uh, experts in, in the tantric world. Uh, you being, uh, you know, obviously the, the 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 main the main dude for this event. So yeah, so I'm really excited to to meet you and uh, and to to have you and, and to learn all the stuff and just to to spread this to people who are you know getting into it. It's going to be freaking exciting. Um, so yeah. So that being said, even before we talk about all that fun stuff, uh, who are you and how in the world did you end up being a professional? Uh, not just a professional. Uh, 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 what's the official word? Uh, tantric guru, tantric teacher, Swami. Yeah, 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 yeah. But People you apparently you, you, you even go teach other teachers. You you teach the teachers. So you're 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 been doing this for what is it twenty? Sorry, you, you've I'm been just... doing this for like twenty plus years or something. Is that right? No, no, no. I've, I've been teaching more, a bit more than a dozen. Uh, oh, two thousand okay. two was the end of my path, and I guess that the my my brag and my shame. Uh, in terms of Tantra is uh, the brag is I didn't engage with teaching at all, not even a little bit, until I was um, complete with my own, which has meant that those that have encountered me in the context of teaching, they're encountering a very different kind of fellow to who I was while I was learning. And that's good, I suppose. But then the, the downside of that is um, while I was learning, there was... There was years when I could have been useful to quite a few people and I uh, didn't give a shit, you know. Mm -hmm. I was uh, on my own track for my own mission and um, that was the way that I pursued it through until the end. Um, I took a little bit of guidance here and there from Osho, from a couple of others. I took Sanyas with Osho eventually as well, uh, but very little actually in the way of guidance in general on my path. And uh, so in, this, in the stats, I'm shabby for an old world Tantra practitioner. Old world Tantric is expected maybe to, from the start of being serious about this stuff, six, seven years and complete with the sexuality. The sexuality is then a matter of choice, not like desire, need, hunger, that, that kind of thing. And that's supposed to happen with uh, just a regular good seeker of a sort of monastic kind of slower path attitude uh, in 20-ish, 27 years or so. That's what I managed. I managed a respectable pace for a monastic guy. But um, I put that down to partly doing it alone, but also the cultural repression, the general background around it, makes us all um, actually sexually retarded. Uh, a bit of a bummer, that. And that's why when Westerners went looking for Tantra in the East, the Tantricus saw them coming and went, whoa. But these guys haven't matured, you know, to through their teenage stuff yet. Mm. They haven't even got into that. Mm. You know, they're not even they, they haven't even got through what a natural fourteen year old gets through. How can they approach our art? And if they looked in the masculine way and you know, they did, they see it as a progression of one thing building on another. So it looks like if you've missed out an early step, oops, you've got to kind of go back, start there, start over. That's why the Westerners they did take on, they taught them like, you know, complex Indian hygiene routines, how to pull strings through their nose and their mouth and stuff like that and how to be a peasant farmer or whatever, you know, trying to uh, start them off and then with the idea of educating them from there over years and years and years. Meanwhile, it's not like that. It's more like a jigsaw puzzle. You know, we get all the bits that we need as we move through life, those of us that have this energy that ultimately ends up with what we can call seeking or being interested in something beyond the mundane physical pleasures, you could say, of life. Not that they're bad, <laughs> but if, if that urge is coming along, you collect all the pieces, you could say, of the path, all the pieces that are necessary. And then to go back, address the sexuality, so what? 
you know, I have people that start, I, I'm working with one woman who's started with this, you can say at 60, as in consciously now into it, at 60 years old. And just the last, I don't know, three, four months of her movement, freaking awesome. I mean, she's been through stuff in days that it takes teenagers like a month of angst and this and that to get through. You know, and I mean, that's teenagers in a natural sense. Our teenagers, for us, our gener my generation, yours, much younger, <laughs> lucky you. But we're all, you know, that, that retardation is severe. The, 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 the sort of current adult sexuality of America, from what I see of it, what its eroticism looks like, is more or less American pie. It's more or less teenage level. It's quite exciting to fly a drone by the girl's bathroom window or something, you know see what your GoPro on it can catch. You know, that, 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 that's a rush for the average American adult, yeah. which is a little scary. You kind of should be through that shit by 12, maybe 14, in a natural sense. But this catching up thing can be done very fast. That's the beauty of it. And then everything else you might have learned and come in contact with, your experiences on ayahuasca, what they filled in out of the necessary, there's quite a few necessary things along the path. Right. And it's not really about having to worry about how I got all the bits. It's just keep on getting what you get. And uh, sure, the sexuality is very core. But I mean, I've worked with people who've been like in meditation 15 years or something. And it's not wasted time because as soon as they've addressed the sexuality and got on that, their, their meditation suddenly moves to a whole different well, level when altogether. You, when you say the path, so what is the ultimate goal of tantric? I mean, let's, let's say someone really doesn't know anything. What, what, what would you say yeah. tantric even is? So, in a sense, the same as all religion, I mean, if we take uh, religion, the, re the word means to put parts together, to realign, really. Realign yourself with the truth of existence. That's the original meaning of the word. And uh, ah, it's expanded into a system of, you know, people control, etc. But even within those systems, even within the Catholic Church and so on, there's orders where they're sincere about it and they actually, you know, get down and try and find God in their way, and so on. Now, out of those in that pursuit, the, the little distinction with Tantra from most other paths, and I mean, you, you get Tantra in Buddhism and Hinduism, you get uh, varieties from quite a range. I would say the Taoists are closely related enough as a separate development to be called a form of Tantra as well. It's, but the, the, the thing that tends to be in common with Tantra, wherever it comes from, is its insistence. It's about the big answers this lifetime or best you know uh speed if there's four methods available the tantric is only interested in which is the quickest and you say well this is the quickest but it's got an 80 percent failure rate uh, because well you know are they, i don't actually want to know the consequences of failure thank you that's for me and he gets on with it you know that's <laughs> that's a that's a good tantra attitude it's so in if you made the spiritual world, if you drew an analogy with sports, you know, like, I don't know, mainstream American Christianity is what? You know, football or WWF wrestling maybe. I don't know, something like that. But uh, Tantra is like bungee jumping, skydiving, what we call in South Africa, cliffing, uh, you know, physically dangerous um, approaches, you know. If the tantric is at the top of the hill and someone else of another religion is at the top of the hill and they've got to get to the bottom, the tantric is the guy who goes straight down the hill, you know, get some bruises, but hey, it's quicker. Hmm. So that attitude in terms of spiritual pursuit means very little patience with complex methods involving complex dogmas and complex, uh, what you're going to call it, daily structures. I mean, there's, there's uses to using those kind of things, but those approaches are slow. Tantra tends to focus on the fast, and because of that, it's uh, using the sexual energies directly in meditation is a pretty common core to most Tantra. And then what I end up with, my teaching, 90% of what I teach as it's expanded, is preparation for that. My first few students were, were you know, ready for that, and that's the context in which I worked with them, introducing them and showing them how this moves as a meditation. But as you know, you had a good journey before that became really even a possibility in you. Yeah? And so now most of my work is that journey, is, is getting to that capacity. So the one level is 
touchwork, what we call touchwork, which is basically training yourself or untraining the reactivity of the body so that you can lie there on a massage table and gorgeous woman can touch you with her most loving, yummy everything from bottom up to top and as it moves through you, you can, you know, ideally you get to where you can absolutely just feel richly every little bit of that sensation, just as you'd listen to and take in like a real good piece of rock, you know, like you know, opera if you're <laughs> way old. I mean, for my old man, it's, it's you know, my lady's opera. But, it, you know, you've got to take in all the volume of it. You've got to take in every subtlety of it, you know, to really appreciate it, to really be able to use this as your meditation. And just to get there, I mean, I think you get a sense of what that is for many guys. It's quite a journey, and women too, um, because someone touches you and the body has its jumps and reactions, responses, things that seem to be instinctive. And they're not. They're mostly trained in. Instinctive is to enjoy, but, you know, it sounds like real fun, yummy work. And, hey, it sometimes, it, it, of course, it goes through being delightful. But the opening stages of that kind of work are things like accepting just this fact of your vulnerability, that you are vulnerable. You've got feelings about that. And until you're finished with your feelings about your vulnerability, well, you can't even actually start to really open to sensation. You can't, someone touches you, you're in your imagination of what that touch is in your mind, symbolic stuff. You're not feeling that touch and, you know, taking it in like you would take in the flavor of a piece of sushi. Mm. Yeah. That's the, uh, one of my favorite little stories of a Tantra master was someone found, it's a friend of mine actually, hunted a guy down and said, great reputation, all please will you teach? And the guy said, not a damn, I'm not interested in that. But I will tell you one little thing. If I was going to teach, there's only one exercise I'd make a group do. And the guy said, so, tell me. So he said, I'd make them eat a peach. Give them a peach. But you take half an hour to eat it, minimum. Minimum half an hour. You know, if that, that would have, you know, like if you could take what that hint of that experience would teach you into your love making, into your business relationships, into everything in life that you want to get every little bit of the savor, the nuance, the juice out of this experience. <laughs> Give it to me. <laughs> That's the attitude of the tantric. Whereas the, the, the Hindu thing, you know, oh, even Buddhist, you know, we've got many, many lives to go, you know, maybe I make some progress this life, but then I'm going to chill out and, you know, hey, I have a couple of incarnations as an earthworm, but then I'll ascend again, you know, this time. And that, that's where the Tantricus came up with the, uh, I mean, I'm afraid it's our fault, it's the Tantricus' fault, because the whole world hates them now. We came up with these apocalyptic myths, you know. The world's going to end now. It's a final end. No more incarnations. We're wrapping it up. There's a judgment day. We're going to close down the whole show. And that was about encouraging the students. Focus. Get in, you know, there's this intent that I say Tantra has. In the old days, they used to insist on it. Now it's just the people who come to it. They tend to have that insistence. You know. But uh, I that, 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 I that was... Uh... <laughs> Tantric is everything, including make apocalyptic myths yeah, yeah. to scare you. I didn't you know there was any apocalyptic propaganda in, in Tantric. I thought it was the Christians <laughs> telling everybody that Doomsday is coming. Yeah, real old school stuff. I mean, it's a bit of Tantric. Hey, we can talk about Western Tantra, though. I suppose the general understanding is. I don't know. I, when I look at my Twitter feed and go look at the hashtag Tantra, uh, wow. Man, uh, mostly it looks like it's a German euphemism for happy ending massage. Mm. Many, many, and not just Germans, but, you know. Uh, and, man, that's a little bit like, I don't know, I don't know if I can think of an analogy. Uh, I suppose a bit like teaching someone to bounce a ball and telling them they're playing soccer. I don't know. <laughs> it's so funny because everybody, as soon as you say tantra, everybody just thinks, okay, uh, it's sex. Like they would think it's ninety percent sex and maybe ten percent something else. But the way you're talking about it, it's actually it's a religion that's based on you know actually becoming enlightened, and then sex is just a part of it. And and, and yet they're not wrong in that um, it, it's massively sexy because if if it's a school that's actually 
got something useful to a Westerner, the biggest thing that us Western, you know, and a modern person, let's not even say Westerner, let's just say modern people, the world's repressed, um, they're going to be addressing that. And if you're addressing that, it, you're, you're either teaching suppression of it, which is generally not the way of Tantra. I mean, you know, nothing is really without the, you know, Tantra can use any method, including suppression. But um, with, with uh, in, in terms of getting people ready to be able to use their sexuality as their meditation, they have to pass through some terribly sexy stuff. They have to wake up to the eroticism they haven't lived, whatever's been repressed or denied in them. And typically, they've got to do some of that. I mean, they can get through a fair amount by looking at it, or, what we, you know, making a bit of a meditation of going into their fantasy with self-loving and really following where it goes. That's useful. But there comes a point with some of those where you know you need something of the real to make this one turn over. And then, you know, they have to go there. I mean, on our groups, gee, in that preparation, we, we, we do stuff that, um, I mean, I know what tantra groups around the world do and so on. Uh, we cross a few lines that most other teachers, most groups would go, oh, it's not a bit edgy, maybe, you know, that's a bit too sexy. I mean, uh, one common cultural eros that tends to be right in the middle of everyone's thing is the money thing, sex, money, the connection of sex and money. And many people would say, and many of my students have said, mm, not my thing, you know. Sex money never had any relationship for me. You know, I got them quite happily in their own departments in life, no problem there, you know. And yet they come on this group and we play a little game with sex and money and they find out, oh my God, yeah, uh, mm, I've got stuff to look at here. You know, I've got stuff to explore here. And they get on with catching up on it. I mean, to play that little group, what we do is we make a little red light district. You know, we, uh, the sort of preparation day, usually like four hours, uh, is looking into it consciously, discussing, you know, what do you feel into the stuff around sex and money, but then also going around everyone in the group and going, well, if you were selling, I would buy, you know, and, uh, you know, what would it be? And then the next day they come along and pitch whatever they've got to sell. And we play with a, you know, money at a kind of monopoly money, you know, very scaled down economy kind of level, and everyone's got a very exact budget, and you know, off they go, and they buy and they sell, and I, I don't actually even know what happens mostly on that group, because my job is to sit around and handle complaints, problems, and people needing direction. So occasionally I look around, oh, there's a couple of guys, and they don't want to buy or sell anything with each other, cool. And they just need a hint, it's like, guys, you know, go pay someone the small money to watch. Oh, oh yeah, <laughs> off they go, you know. Um, so, but for me, it's, it's, it's not about what they do. I mean, some groups, there, there have been groups in the past that have worked into areas of eros like that. You know, the, the, the Osho um, schools did a lot of that kind of work in the 70s. They don't really do so much of it now. But th that kind of... Um, I mean, there, when someone wants to be a bit of a ninny with it, you know, so they can watch, pay little money and just watch things, and that's their whole experience. But someone goes in there, experienced with this path, knowing, wow, I've got stuff in this area, they can go into that kind of process with an attitude of, okay, I'm finishing it now, I'm going right through to the end of this for me. And right through to the end of it means, you've noticed, you've been a man who follows your eros well in life, when you go to that thing or that person or that form of sex or whatever it is that you feel a great attraction, a great heat for, and you really meet it, yeah? Well, it's, you, you meet what's called disillusion. You meet the truth of it, you meet what it is. Maybe it's really nice, you know, maybe not. But it's never what you had going on about it five minutes before you did it, never. That always crumbles away and something new reveals, but that one dies. Then it's in your range. Then, you know, you can play with someone in that zone, but it's not a hunger you have anymore. It's not, it's not something that drives you. So it's, it seems uh, like it's, it's really learning through experience and getting through your shit by experiencing and then getting to the next level. Exactly, and it's using your sexual energies to catch up on the drive that sexuality is supposed to have done with us, that we, you know, have the cultural delay about, but get through that and use those energies to drive us. Literally, I encourage people 
to get free and wild enough to crash into the experiences in, the, in life that are going to bring them all their emotional pain, trauma, and turmoil, which basically means it's going to, they're going to create situation after situation that evokes whatever they put away once upon a time that was too rough to feel typically in the childhood. Mm. And then all that stuff gets felt. And it's not endless when you're using the power of sexuality with it. Mm. It's a strong, you know, it's a strong energy. So it's not endless. And people get scared. Whoa, I'm running out of things that I can think about and get horny, you know? Because that's really the definition of eroticism. If you think it and it makes you horny, well, it's... Well, that's what, I, that's what I'm thinking. Because when I was, you know, uh, younger, I mean, I, I could literally just think about some girl I, I fooled around with and I, I would get a hard on and ready to go. I can't, yeah. I, honestly, if I sit here now and think about sexual experiences, I'm not going to get a hard on anymore. That's it. I mean, <laughs> I, honestly, I, I would... Uh, <laughs> you have to also... <laughs> what, don't, I'm worried I about that right as thick as shit. <laughs> Yes, I know. Uh, look, it's the, 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 the nice thing, the lucky thing for my students is we set, uh, we set them up to expect it, you know? I had one the other day who was really just, she's really strongly going into that. Uh, the old phrase for it, it's called the desert. And it's like the energy, the river of your life flows there into the sands and it just, where the fuck did it go? Just straight in the sands and gone. And the answer, and, and, and what it is, it's, it's as that happens, you may well be nearing this. You, there's fewer and fewer things that your mind gets to be the biggest sexual organ with. Mm. And you have to, unfortunately, the bad news is you have to go through that, you have, and it's not for long, you have to lose the taste of what's called the false, the taste of your mind doing it into your body completely. That has to stop. And it has to stop, not from you stopping it or forcing it, from you can feel there's a natural process happening in you where that is starting, that is stopping. There are some things now that you could think about all day, there's some kinds of porn you could look at and it would do nothing. You'd look and you go, oh well, it's a computer screen, you know. Like, oh, there's an image on it, so what? So yes, it's a porn, mm, yeah, so what? You know? Because you've met the illusion, the porn isn't the love. This form of sex isn't the love. That kind of woman isn't the love. You've, you know, you've explored these things and you've found the disillusion, the disillusion, the disillusion. And at the end of it, what is your last one, it goes, and then there's this little gap. And the, what you become aware of in the gap, what I was helping this woman with just yesterday, was she's touched into that gap and I put her on my table and the whole exercise was about now, now, directly feel the real, directly feel exactly the real. So one way is just the heat, the true heat, you're with a woman and she has a heat for whatever reason. She thinks you're a bad boy and her mind's doing stuff to her genitals. Great, doesn't matter why the heat's there. You will resonate with the heat and up will come your energy. Any form of eroticism, any play that you've enjoyed in the past. Someone else that's into that, yes, you can meet them in that. You'll find that as the heat happens in them, sure as shit it happens in you too. You'll also find it a little weird when the heat's finished in them, it will also be finished in you. You won't be rolling along with some other energy of your own. Oh, it's done now. And then you get a hint of the kind of stuff that I work with sometimes in, in uh, when, when we do stuff, most of Eros, most erotic stuff is met in life, but every now and again someone's got something to face that's not faceable in life or dangerous to arrange or something, and they end up with me in a sessions context playing with it, like in our sessions room. And there for me, I can respond to anything that's in my range, anything that I've lived, and that's quite a, quite a range, not everything. But if it's in my range, yes, I can meet it. And yeah, I can be a support to someone in that because it's not my heat. Really not. I enjoy it while it's there with them, but when it's finished and then it's finished in me, over. And so happy. That's why when we ejaculate, girls get bored. I see. Ah, this ejaculation thing. The first talk I ever gave about Tantra, down the road here in Cape Town, not, you know, years and years ago. And there was a French guy there who heckled me. He said, he said, yes, yes, but you tantricers, you teach not to ejaculate. And then you try that with a woman, and the women don't like it. They don't like it. 
You know, <laughs> and That's of course, exactly what a French person would say. <laughs> <laughs> Arrogant fuckers, all of them. <laughs> I mean, a lot of women. I mean, of course, where do they get their training about sexuality? Shit, they get it from young men. That's scary. Yeah. You know. Yeah. So, what are they focused on? Getting his ejaculation out of him. You know. And even women who go, oh, I hate it that he's only two minutes, and wow, wow, wow. I've worked with quite a few couples, and I know most Tantra people will focus completely on the guy and you know, give him 140 ways, usually of suppressing his energy, which I think is the wrong way to go, to try and calm himself down so he doesn't come so quick. You know, they'll hammer the guy with that. I, the guy needs work, sure. There we are. The guineas to guineas take care of the guy. But with the woman, I often have to be a bit clear with her that she's, she is set up to be automatic about getting his ejaculation. And there are things a woman's body can do that a man's body's going to ejaculate unless he's really doing his towers shut up the yazoo and he's like holding on to his energy like, well, you, know, you know what I mean? Like, you know, and uh, I mean, for me, it's, you know, if a woman does that to me, I don't know, you know, sorry, you, you know, if your body wants it like that, well, have it. Or if I don't want to give it, I'm getting out of here. But, you know, <laughs> <laughs> there's a, there, I'm, I'm saying there is a female side to that story too. And when women learn to, okay, I want to take this energy of his, I want to, you know, feel into, you know, really go where this energy can happen and opens to him. Then for a start, the opening gives him less pushback, less friction, less pressure on his prostate gland, so it doesn't push him towards ejaculation so much anymore. And she starts to experience being a woman and doing what you can call enfolding or what the Dakinis call sky dancing, as in, you know, really enjoying the energy that this man has here for her, as opposed to let me finish him off, let me stop his energy. Mm. And it's actually like a taking and, and and then, of course, they come to a point where a woman decides, actually, at some point, yeah, she wants that energy of his ejaculation. And then the the body, you know, letting the body do its thing with that, you know. I mean, you, 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 you've had that. I mean, I'm sure you've had where you've been gritting your teeth and a woman has just wrestled the ejaculation right out of you, you know. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. almost like a decision. It's not, at some point you're just like, oh, fuck it then, you know. But uh, yeah. No, it's like you want it that, you know, exactly. If the only's doing that to, you know, if that's what's, that, yeah. You know, if a, when, when a woman's feeling more expansive and going into the meditation of it and the sky dancing of it, sure, it's, you know, she opens in a different way. She opens in a way that doesn't encourage that. That encourages a much more subtle kind of experience for the male. I mean, that's where some men have a Well, I mean, like you, were, like you were saying, it's it's like we're so repressed sexually that most guys just getting in the position where they can even have sex. Cause we, like we, just before we did our thing here, um, I, I briefly spoke to, to my wife just for a second. And, uh, you know, I did this uh, intro I was going to use. And I was just talking about how, you know, most guys are really, really bad in bed. And that's why kind of I never even had to go and learn deeper stuff because I could last an hour. So that already made me a sexual superstar. So I didn't have to do anything else. And, and she said to me, um, she was asking me, do guys try and talk to each other about getting better and stuff like that? And I said, honestly, I do. I'm a professional dating coach, but most guys, absolutely not. And because they're so desperate just to get anything they can get that just um, <laughs> never, never get mind getting better. Let's get something. Let's just get my penis into something, you know? So honestly, I don't think most guys are really that worried about, which is disturbing. Like you would think you'd want to be good at it, right? <laughs> like if that's what, if you're, you know, and what, what's retarded is, and I, and I always joke about this, is that men have all these uh, really long-term insane strategies of getting a mate. Uh, for example, becoming a lawyer or a doctor <laughs> so they can make lots of money and get a fancy car and house and then they'll get women. I've got a Mercedes Benz and the big 15-bedroom house it's, and my it, it, post it's, it's, 50 it's, friends party it's, it's, every weekend with cocaine and then I'll pick the woman of my dreams. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. ridiculous. But, uh, <laughs> but invest in, a, you know, getting good in the bedroom, for example. No, let's not do that. Or, uh, let's, right. yeah, it's ridiculous. It is. I mean, that's that's um, at the, at the end of one retreat. Uh, in fact, that retreat that I, I met you, I met you just after that retreat in India. At the end of that retreat, uh, I I 
at the end of it, I had, they were all in a bit of a high, and that's cool, you know, a wonderful experience for them. But then I laid into the guys a bit just with, you know, you say you're interested and you look at your interests and your passions. So what? We've got your football team, we've got your car, we've got your work, we've got your um, hobby, your interest, you know, whatever it is. We've got uh, your father's stuff that you into and so on. And, you know, we've, you, you've got we've got all these things you keep up on, all these things you spend money pursuing, all these things that you're there to experience. And above them all, you'd say, oh, I love women more than all of that. How much have you learned about them? How much do you know of a woman's anatomy? Actually, I mean, the, the Western medical world is starting to catch up now with what it knew before the Victorian era. You know, because it suppressed it in the Victorian era, lost what they, they lost what they lost what little they had. Still haven't got it all back yet. There's still pre-Victorian texts that are better than modern medical texts. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that doesn't surprise me one bit. And understandings and so on. There's so so so. Um, I, you know, I, I was really challenging them to. You know, you say this is an interest. You say this is a buzz. Well, look at your commitment to it. Look at where you put yourself on the line for it. Look where you put your energy into learning about it, and look at that. You know. Mm-hmm. And then uh, I left. I had some stuff to do, and my co-teacher, you met Wendy. She kind of finished up. And afterwards, I did have to go by and say to her, "Look, I just want to check. After I hammered them like that, you did congratulate them, did you?" And she said, "Oh yes, you know." And that's also due, because just by being on that retreat, and I mean, just by guys, even I mean, this is the thing I have to acknowledge about even the pickup community, which now yeah, doesn't necessarily find a lot of friends around tantra easily all the time. But one thing that I'll say for it for sure is the guys around that stuff. Oh, thank God. They're actually a little bit conscious, a little bit intent on uh, I want to actually get to a woman. How would I how would I make myself more interesting? How would I manage that? You know? Like good. That immediately propels you into the thin end of the bell curve, with the fat end of the bell curve being counted as absolutely useless. And in old language of Tantra, um, you know, you can all be bloody glad I don't write the laws because my definition of rape, well, by my definition of rape, all us bloody men are rapists until we've learned a hell of a lot. You know, it's, it's, uh, uh, well, for me, there's a lot to learn. I mean, hey, none of you all going to get your license for sex if I was giving them out. I mean, <laughs> I'm very grudging with that, you know. Uh, well, I consider myself, I've got my beginner's permit, so that's pretty good. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. <laughs> I mean, and as I said, fortunate for me as well that I'm not making the laws. I mean, it's not like I was any better than anyone else. One, one of the little old sayings of Tantra was, a, a young man is worse for a woman's sexual development than a rapist. It sounds harsh, but there's a truth to it. Because physiologically, exactly the same thing happens. She's not ready for penetration. He's pushing in too early. He's um, basically getting a more or less a reflexive lizard level thing going, pumping into his ejaculation. And she's taking a little bit of pain and some damage. And the more she constricts against it, the worse it's going to be. And at the end of the experience with the rapist, she knows it was an assault. Mm. But with the young man, this was love. And it's her first experience of the physicality of love. And then she comes to me 20 years later when she's starting to find that actually maybe it should be a bit different from what he seems, it seems to work for him. Mm. Bad. Worse than a rapist. It's horrible. Actually, now they put it that way, it's really fucking horrible. And it actually just goes so in line with this whole male-dominated society, right? Like, every, if you look around you, it's all fucked. Everything you described is what we're doing to the planet, to each other, politics, how we treat Native people, how do we treat the... Everything. It's what you just said. It's fucked. So is it really any... any any When you come from that culture, is it any surprise, really, that sex is also male-dominated, essentially, a rape? It's just... That's how we run it. It's fucking brutal, and the only thing that can stop that is is, is a planetary consciousness, just an awakening of, of uh, you know, of us as a species. 
women say to me, oh, I have this troubling eroticism to rape. I say, no, you don't have this troubling eroticism to rape. You have this little bit of perception about the truth of what you've been doing so far. Mm. You know, you're hot for rape because that's all you know. <laughs> harsh. But, that's harsh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but well, the, truth is, the truth is brutal. What patriarchy has managed to lock down is, is it's per, this, this sexual retarded thing. It's, it's not just the sort of churches saying, oh, it's evil, and even the atheists trying to show the religious guys that they're good, so they also become sexually repressed and whatever. It's not just, it's, 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 uh, um, I lost my track. Isn't, isn't it amazing that sex is still shunned? I mean, look, look at me, I'm out here and I'm, I'm basically telling people, look, tell women the truth, tell them they're gorgeous, tell them you want to sleep with them, take, take them out, have a good time, and, and, and it's, it's a beautiful thing, I'm, you know. You, you can you can transform your entire life by actually getting a set of balls and running after pretty girls and that's what happens to my students when once they realize actually they're it's okay to fail and uh, but if you keep on at it and you keep being honest with women some of them are going to like you and you're you're going to end up having some great experiences and that happens uh, and it's 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 life changing and yet it's still uh, it's still you know it's being attacked in the media you're a horrible if you walk up to a girl and hit on her it's like in in America you can lose your job or be a, you know <coughs> literally for telling a girl she looks looks attractive at work you can be sacked you know it's a, it's absurd so it's still in this day and age still you're a fucking predator if you having sex and lasting 10 seconds and then never calling a girl after you picked her up in a nightclub after getting her drunk that's totally fine, but if you're yes. still, but that's absolutely wonderful. That's normal. That's the standard. You should be doing that. Spend well, money, go to a club, right. spend five hundred bucks. <laughs> drug test paper is fine. That's absolutely fine. However, if you're stone Off cold sober in a Starbucks Off and you walk up to a girl and go, "You're right, you're quite attractive," shame on you. That's harassment. Don't talk to her. You shouldn't do that. You should, you should be get her drunk first in a club and then have sex with her for ten seconds. Then you're a good boy. That's that's where we're at. <laughs> it's, it's absurd. Oh, this is why why Cape Town's so lovely. <laughs> uh, we've got the sort of industrial mining, you know, rape Africa's resources city, Johannesburg, up the road. And there you walk around the streets of Johannesburg and you look at a woman and she kind of quickly takes notes of you, takes a photo on her phone and makes a little note of it in case you attack, attack you know, puts it on her Facebook as a suspicious character, right? That's what happened immediately. Cape so. Town, no. You look, <laughs> she's smiling. You know, you think this is, you, you smile back. She smiles warmly. I mean, that's. Uh, <laughs> well, if we could get it to a point where men would actually just go and say hello to a girl who smiled at them, then uh, it would be a very different world. Instead of we, we well, just. No, I mean, then, yeah, you suppose you'd still have to say hello. I mean, <laughs> look, I'm done with all that. Doesn't apply to me. <laughs> 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 beautiful mm. well uh well that's good that seems like a almost a natural uh natural uh natural end it doesn't apply to me this interview is over but uh wonderful so any uh idea for anyone uh listening in uh what might be um uh, some of the insights or or they might uh oh. they might learn after they see your uh presentation uh, uh next oh. month yeah. How do we tease? Uh, how do we tease the people? I think this was this was a big forty-five minute tease, to be honest. So, um, well, maybe none of my students are going to see this. I don't tell. How about this? I have a good one. What about what about a word a word of advice for anyone out there who is interested yeah. in the tantric path? They wanna they wanna not just get good in bed. They wanna they really wanna push the limits a little bit and and explore and uh, and sort of get to that higher truth that we're we're talking about. What would be a good first step, or maybe even maybe even share with them maybe one simple exercise they could do to, to just experience something where they go, oh, maybe there's something to this. It's not just a two crazy I, I, two crazy think, guys talking I, I all the time. I think do better than that. We've got to, let's let them let's let them cheat and fake it as how to fake it as a tantra master. Isn't that that's going to be more immediately fun? Okay, that's not correct, but whatever. But I think that's better. So little trick to fake it a bit. Uh, I think we all know the classic little, what they call the Yab Yam sculpture, yeah, the Shiva and the Shakti, the god and the goddess sitting together, very embraced, her legs wrap around him at the back, he calls her close. Now, so that's the position that you, 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 must, you know, you have on your agenda that you hopefully go towards. Good to have extra long foreplay, etc., much lubrication, much openness, because it's a very deep penetration position that's quite intense. And when in that, 
There's the cheating is this. St uh, the, the heel of your foot, probably the left foot, but the heel of the foot can get underneath the perineum. You know what I mean? Just forward of the anus, compress that pipe. So, so, so wait, so let's get this straight from the, let's pretend we're all beginners here. Right. Uh, the okay. woman. So the woman's going to sit in your lap, basically. Mm -hmm. You're going to sit down, cross-legged. Yeah? So sit down, cross-legged. She sits into your lap. And in that position, you can get the heel of, you know, the, the heel of one foot directly under your perineum. In other words, you sit on it a little bit so that you can close it off. You can put pressure on it. So hope, much foreplay. Go into this with a strong erection, lots of heat. Don't worry about, oh, if I build too much heat, then I'm going to pop. No, you're not. Because that pressure that the heel can put just on the perineum, just really at the base, base, base of the penis, just before where it reaches the anus, there, pressing there. You're cheating. You're locking the penis off kind of in erection, and you're locking it off that it's quite difficult for it to ejaculate. Probably won't. And so that even if it does ejaculate, you can probably still close it. The erection probably still stays quite a while, and later you can let the ejaculation go and have a whole second experience of it. But the point is... You can immediately cheat way beyond, you know, if normally two, three minutes, five minutes is your thing or whatever, you can cheat way beyond that. She can taste something of what you've been telling these guys is, yes, put yourself out on the thin end of the bell curve there, learn one or two little skills, immediately puts you out there. And the poor woman haven't seen even the most basic shit out there for centuries. So... <laughs> For centuries. You, I mean, it's sad, but they are. You I know? just love the casualness in which you deliver the lab for centuries. Like, you, like you know what's been happening for centuries. For centuries, these women have been disappointed. It's just funny. Yeah, funny. I remember it's every one of them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, I mean, imagine. I mean, look, I saw uh, uh, some some film. I don't even remember the film, or, or but I just remember the scene that was just brutal. It was like in you know the eighteen hundreds somewhere, and uh, there's a man dressed up in red as a British British you know soldier. And, uh, you know, somehow he gets into a cabin with a woman and, uh, you know, they rip each other's clothes off and he literally gets on top of her, pumps away for literally four or five seconds and then it's over. He's happy and you just see the look on her face and I just think, fucking hell, things haven't really changed that much. <laughs> you know, and I'm thinking, this this guy's such a dick, he doesn't know anything. And I'm just like, actually, uh, I've been that dick before. I've pretty much had those experiences, but at least con at least I was trying and I was just too excited and I fucked it up. But five minutes later, I'll I'll tell you what I had another go and I lasted slightly longer. So that was something. Um, but yeah, yeah, we haven't uh, we haven't matured uh, so much past that. It's, it's pretty sad. Um, but what? But I'm really excited. I'm I'm, I'm super I'm super stoked actually to um, to really get into this. I'm, I'm reading some stuff. I'm going to be practicing more with the wife. We, uh, and uh, and I want to meet you and and do more. And, and you know, I might even get my ass down there uh, to uh, South Africa myself and do some training with you in person. That would be freaking awesome. But uh, but please, I'm sure the guy, uh, the, you know, a bunch of people are gonna uh, want to know more about you. So please tell them about your your book, which I think is fantastic, and about your website and how they can get in contact with you if they want to meet you or train with you or, or at the very least get your book, uh, which is a great start in tantra. Cool. So um, uh, the book I wrote, uh, basically nine chapters each, picking on an area of the path, obviously that I consider important or consider more important than the things I left out. And each chapter really is a, is a story, there's a story hopefully illustrating the point I'm trying to make. And then the story breaks in the middle and gives a bit of a lecture about it. Um, in terms of Tantra books out there, uh, I did write it very deliberately to fill in the bits other books don't mention, as in... I'm not trying to, uh, it's, it's, not, it's not trying to be a compendium of all the existing work so far or something. There's some classics out there, there's some really good things to read. I do believe, minus the Prince of Salt makes a little bit of a difference to some of those. Some of those, uh, you've, you've, like you've come across Monte Cheer stuff, nice and strong, but maybe a little over-refined, maybe a little bit masculine in its focus on some things, you know, getting a little bit overworked, over-intense on things. I try and adjust for those bits. And the main, 
flavor of the book is I'm trying to encourage Tantra people, that's who it's written for really, into uh, taking the journey of their eroticism with a bit of um, seriousness, you know, a bit of sincerity and really getting into it. And so therefore, um, the book's a little, it's, it's uh, I wrote it, some of it with a pretty deliberate erotic intent. Um, you know, um, I'm glad to hear that uh, some women have dropped it in the bath and, uh, you know, found it difficult to read with one hand and things like that. So um, that's, that's, that's gratifying. That's part of the intent is to help stir those juices and give them a bit of a direction and inclination. Um, what I loved about your book is that it wasn't it wasn't fucking boring because I, I tried to read some of these other books, even the multi orgasmic man. I couldn't get through it, you know. I, I took one or two things, and I, but it was just bloody boring, you know. You're just reading, and it's like, okay, do this exercise, and then you read it, and you go, okay, great, and then you go to the next thing. It's just another fucking exercise. And well, how many can you really get into your head? I mean, you you forget ninety percent of everything you read. But with your book, the stories are um, they're just interesting, and you and it's like it's a crazy story. You don't know what the hell's going to happen, and then so you realize at the end of the story, oh, this is a, some kind of kinky exercise that makes something happen or makes you realize something. But at the same time, you're getting a cool story, and you're learning about this thing. <laughs> so it's really cool. So you're learning about crazy tantric shit without a fuck. Okay, and then you insert your penis on this angle, and then you pump three, four times, and then you breathe out, and then you pump three times. It's like it's much more interesting. So I, I actually recommend this book first now. I used to mention multi orgasmic man because I didn't I didn't know any better, but now this is the book I tell guys to, to to read first because it'll at least open up their minds to it's fun and interesting and there's all the, it's it's a fun read first of all it's a fun read and you get to learn all this stuff and then at the end of the book then there's all the boring fucking exercise so it's beautiful so it's, you, you got you got it all yeah. you got it all there in one so <laughs> yes that 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 seven's rhythm oh man give it a try I feel bad I don't have an affiliate link for your book because uh, technically I could be making buck buck twenty five a pop but it's fine it's a great book people should get it. Uh, I'll put, I'll include the link below as well um, to uh, to either the book or your website where they can get the book. But if the good people uh, want to learn more about you and your courses and your whole, you got your own bloody tantra school. So tell them how to find you and and what's going on there. Well, a uh, YouTube channel. Um, uh, let me see. Probably the best place to pick that up from is the website. So that's it would be advaitantra dot com. Advait is a d v a i t. T A N T R A dot com, and uh, links from there should generally get you off to a good start. Um, there's a Facebook uh, group that where students chat. I don't uh, pop in there anymore. Um, I decided long ago to leave them to it rather than playing professor mm -hmm. and uh, things like that around. And um, yeah, we'll pick up the YouTube channel as well. And my Twitter feed is A Rahasia. I R A H A S Y A. Okay. Probably that's Enough. And if anyone hasn't figured out, you're in back in South Africa. Yeah. Um, teachers get around all over the place. Things happen in different parts of the world. But my preference, I like people coming here. And uh, yeah, November, December, I've I'm I've got people arriving from England and California, and I'm not getting out of here those two months. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So. <laughs> Um, that's the way I prefer it. Yeah, well, fair enough. Well, it's easy to make them come to you. I'm getting to that point too. I've been traveling a lot, but now I'm just like, I think I'd like to stay in one place and be lazy and have everyone come here. So I think that's there's going to be more of that going on in my future at some point. All right, buddy. So, uh, so yeah, awesome sauce. So I look forward to um, seeing you uh, in uh, about a month, very soon. <laughs>